Hello, everybody. So I welcome you at the panel discussion investments and pivots during pandemic on feedback on fintech and blockchain. And today I have um, a number of honorable investor participants during our panel discussion and we'll start with a round of brief introductions. My name is Nadia Nistirova. I'm an independent director of the National Alter Entrepreneur Investment Management Association and advisor to a number of leading GPs in private equity, venture capital, private equity, real estate and hedge funds. And um, uh, I will introduce each of the investors uh, with uh, uh, keywords on their companies and their investment focus. Uh, Sierra, could you please join uh, our panel with a brief intro on yourself? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you to Valentina Dimitri for having me as part of this panel, and also uh, to Elena for coordinating this event and Nadia for moderating. So blockchain has become a universal concept in a relatively short period of time, which has defined our generation and has many implications and use cases in multiple sectors. And I'm very glad to be part of this panel today. Um, I'm Sierra Troy, advisor at the White Lake Strategic Advisory Group based in the UK. And I am currently coming to you live from South Korea. At White Lake, we primarily work with startups to gain traction and as an advisory, help them secure capital. In the past, we've worked with companies in the energy, fintech, and biotech sectors. Blockchain is an area we are still investigating and I think has vast potential in unifying communities through borderless transactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sierra. And um, Alexander, would you also join us with a brief intro? Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Alex. I'm from Paris. I co-founded Gains Associates, which is a crypto community on Telegram. It is one of the biggest general crypto community out there. We've been around for two and a half years now, so we've survived two bear markets. We publish daily news, uh, insightful articles, and we've also raised more than $3 million for various projects. I'll just name a couple. We've been very happy to work with Unibright and Quant Network, for example. And recently, I've invested into Avalabs with the famous Emin Gun Sirer and uh, Clayton as well, the South Korean project with the giant cacao that's behind. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here. We also host tons of events with cool projects in the space so that our members can get to know more about crypto and blockchain. Thank you, Alex and Ivalo. Thank you for uh, having me, uh, Ivailo Jordanov. I'm with 7% uh, Venture uh, Ventures. We are a early stage fund based in London. Um, we invest in deep tech uh, and transformative technology. Uh, we're not uh, any sector specific. We look for billion dollar opportunities uh, across uh, those sectors. Uh, and we invest as early as possible. We like to come in sort of together with angels or first institutional capital. Uh, and looking at um, opportunities in uh, mostly in the UK, but also some in Europe and the US. Thank you. And um, also, Adrian, could you also uh, give us a couple of words on yourself again? <laughs> Adrian, you're on mute. Hello, everybody. I'm live now, right? Uh, thank you very much for having me here for the fifth or I believe sixth time. Um, kudos first to LA Token team and especially to Nadia and Elena for putting all the time value, value, value and uh, uh, helping a lot of the uh, ecosystem. I'm here on behalf of uh, Faster Capital which is a Dubai-based accelerator and incubator for companies. I'm working as a regional director for UK and Romania, uh, Cloudcoin Consortium as uh, a CMO EMEA and uh, Virgin Startups as a mentor. Thank you very much again for having me here and congratulations to the ones who are watching this and getting a lot of value. Thank you, Adrian. And Henry, could you also introduce yourself? Yes, uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for having me here in the Lake Token. Appreciate the opportunity. And we are here. Uh, I'm a founder and a managing partner of HHN Capital. I provide advisory services with startups, mostly on the finance side, fractional CFO. 
So that's my first hat. <clears throat> the second hat is I'm a venture partner for a venture fund uh, looking for early stage companies to invest. My primary focus are fintech, blockchain, consumer, AI, ML, and IoT. Um, I would say the majority of the time I spend uh, in those verticals and then the remaining probably 30% I look for everything else. Everything else consider verticals with great market potential and something I can wrap my hands around it. Thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to the event. Thank you, Henry. And Henry Asli. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Henry Asli. I uh, am been an entrepreneur for about 25 years now. And uh, I've also co-founded uh, Vid Ventures, which is an early stage uh, fund out of uh, Beirut and Paris. We have two funds. Uh, right now I'm live in Beirut. And um, we uh, focus on uh, early stage uh, gig, uh, crypto, gaming, uh, pretty much all sorts of uh, tech stuff. And I'm also doing um, technology advisory for uh, one of our portfolio companies called uh, HedgeGuard, which is uh, one of the uh, few uh, crypto hedge fund software companies. And Charles? This is my second time joining the panel, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Charles Wu, and I am the vice president of GSR Matrix Fund. Uh, we are a venture capital investment firm focusing mainly on industries in AI, blockchain, cloud computing, big data, and Internet of Things. Um, we are based in Hong Kong, and we have locations in Taipei, Silicon Valley, and Beijing. Uh, we also run the Hong Kong Blockchain Association, in which uh, uh, focuses on in incubation of startups and education in blockchain. Together with GSR Matrix, uh, we currently have investments in Singapore, China, US, UK, and Hong Kong. And we welcome pro projects globally. And typically we look at earlier projects uh, around pre A to A series. And thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Charles and Kishan. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, excited to be joining this panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Last Token, for having me for the second time. Uh, really enjoyed the first session a couple of months ago. Uh, my name is Kishan Nadaraja. I'm an investment principal at BOB Capital. Uh, BOB Capital is an early stage venture capital fund based in Singapore and Sri Lanka. We predominantly invest in South Asia. Uh, We're investing out of two funds right now, and uh, we have invested across 13 early stage ventures uh, ranging from uh, ed tech, healthcare, consumer, uh, AI, ML. Uh, we're really sector agnostic and we invest across the board uh, wherever there's good tech and you know, any, any company that, that can really solve uh, major problems uh, uh, in the South Asian region. Uh, currently we are focusing in, uh, in FinTech, uh, largely in lending, wealth management, uh, robo advisors, you know, etc. Uh, consumer space, health tech, and ed tech. Uh, we typically invest uh, in the Series A stage, uh, and 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 our usual ticket size is about a million dollars right now. Yeah, happy to be here, and uh, hello to everyone. Thank you, Kishan and Taiwo. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Ellie Token team. Um, excited to be here. So my name is Taiwo Ketiku. Um, and I'm the vice president at uh, EcoVC Partners. We have offices in Lagos, in Nigeria, Nairobi, in uh, Kenya, and uh, offices in London, in the UK. But majority of our team sits in Lagos. Um, at EcoVC, we like to refer to ourselves as seed and early stage uh, VC fund um, investors. We are generally sector agnostic, and we focus our investments on tech and tech-enabled tech companies um, in Africa. We are currently and gradually expanding that to other emerging markets beyond Africa. Uh, we've been around since 2014 and have made, um, I think, over 30 investments um, so far um, to date, um, majorly around our investment thesis, around lubricants, uh, fragility, lift, and organizing the offline. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, the first question to all would be, uh, was there any effect of the current pandemic on your investment process? And 
would you uh, like to share some cases of successful recent investments? Uh, so, uh, Alexander, would you like to start with that? Sure. I wouldn't say there's been much change, to be honest. I invest essentially only in crypto. Crypto is kind of regarded as a safe haven. I mean, that was the narrative, right, regarding Bitcoin in terms of crisis. It's like something totally different. Um, some crypto businesses that have real use cases, for example, uh, Traveler, right, that uh, sells cheap flights, obviously was very affected, but it didn't really affect my investment. I, As I said earlier, I invested into Clayton and it's going very well. Uh, it pumped recently. Uh, it's a South Korean project and these do get pumped a lot. Uh, they have a huge ecosystem. Uh, Kakao over there has 50 million users. They have a near uh, monopoly on the mobile market and the Clayton wallet is going to be used by all the mobile users in South Korea. So essentially they're going to start with 50 million users. So very happy about this one. Besides that, not really much impact since I'm just very much into crypto. Thank you, Alexander and Sierra. So what was new in your investment uh, process or focus? Or was there any change in the way you assess projects or maybe new formats introduced uh, during the online communication with your investment targets? Well, I mean, as far as the investments, when I think IMF Chief Christine Lagarde made the announcement in 2018 that governments around the world should all set up their own cryptocurrencies, we have seen an influx of investment to digitalize currency at central banks via CBDC, and also seen the rise of stablecoin projects such as Facebook's Libra, and the Chinese government just recently announcing their proposal for regional stable coins. And as um, the previous colleague had mentioned in you know, Kakao's Clayton as well. So, however, I think blockchain encompasses more than cryptocurrencies and stable coins. And there seems to also be a trend towards managing and tracking the supply chain in manufacturing and production. Um, so far, we have seen companies in the US and China continue to dominate funding in blockchain with US companies such as Coinbase, Tether and Ripple taking 51% of the overall global funding and um, with the UK, 4%. Um, I also think that um, fintech leaders in the traditional financial services, such as Square and Robinhood, are now offering crypto products. And many others are expanding custodial and trading products to benefit um, crypto inflows. Exchanges are adding insurance for crypto clients. So this is an overall trend that cryptocurrencies are rapidly becoming mainstream. I've even recently heard of a colleague who um, heard of a risky producer in Kentucky in which they are creating a staking model for their own digital coin project. So this is an area which is rapidly altering the lands lands landscape of investment. But as far as um, the impacts of co the coronavirus, I think um, investment in cryptocurrencies has significantly declined, um, is what our assessment is. Thank you so much, Sierra. And um, Ivailo, what's new on your side? Many, any of the recent investment cases you would like to share or maybe changes in the investment pro process? So, I mean, we've been, we've been very active. Um, this year we've done 14 investments to date and out of them, seven have been after the pandemic started, the official lockdown, lockdown period. And we have a number of uh, others in the pipeline. In terms of change, I guess for us, we now look for the company to raise more capital so they have a longer runway because the expectation is that maybe uh, funding will start to dry out um, a little bit over the next uh, year to 18 months. And so we want to see companies put more, um, more money in the bank. Um, we see that across the board because we now have companies which, you know, their round was officially sort of technically closed and then they would reach back out and say, actually, we decided to extend the round now to, to, to get more runway. Um, 
Interestingly, we see angels incredibly active. Um, as a recent example, we invested in a company called Climate, uh, which is actually a, an investment. It's an app that enables people to invest in um, sustainable, uh, sustainable investments. It's sort of a mixture between a portfolio manager and a robo advisor. Um, they went on a crowd cube, uh, crowdfunding round. Their target was um, 400,000 um, pounds. We dropped our investment when they were sort of approaching a million and they ended up closing the funding round at 1.5 million. So the appetite was, was, was very strong. Uh, and we see that across, um, across other um, companies raising from angels. So actually angels are more active. I don't know if it's because some people are bored and they've got more time to look at deals and uh, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, we see this as a good opportunity. We think that for companies that are good, this is a good opportunity to focus and build. There's less competition for talent. There's less competition for um, clients. Um, and so we think that this is a good opportunity. It's a time to actually invest and fund the good companies now. Thank you, Velo. And um, Adrian, would you like to comment on the recent cases or maybe observations in the segment? Uh, what I did a lot during this period, I did a lot of uh, mentoring for startups and even gave away uh, dozens of uh, uh, free uh, calls to help as many startups to uh, pivot or to to um, uh, optimize their message to their target market. I'm a little bit obsessed by income. So uh, any project has to produce income. And this is one of my uh, uh, obsessions how to say. Also, I worked with the professionals to transform their um, experience and skills into digital products and, uh, and uh, online courses. Um, we have in, uh, in pre-launch a very big project called Lolly, which is selling customer interactions to brands and will save a lot of business for retail companies having a lot of problems these days, plus uh, very active on uh, on the uh, VC side, uh, analyzing uh, projects. It's very good that uh, at the time uh, uh, taking uh, the children to school and the kindergarten is reserved for more work, which is like one hour and a half every day. I'm a little bit of workaholic, but this is where I'm at. Great, thank you, Adrian. And Charles, would you share something you on your side uh, so is there any change in your investment process or observations on new uh, cases of recent investments you would like to share hi can everyone hear me hello yes, yes yeah. You. yeah so um i agree with um um son syria Syrah, um, which is that um, um, our observation as well is that uh, crypto companies are are currently declining. Um, we believe is because that the pandemic has caused um, um, crypto um, crypt, uh, crypto projects to move back to big countries such as uh, China and the United States, whereas before uh, it was mostly focused on um, Southeast Asia and, and uh, countries that are less um, that are more free in terms of financial. Um, and company registrations. And um, also, um, I do believe angels are, are more active as well currently because um, for us, we, we've been seeing a lot of projects that um, uh, previously, it, which would be out of our touch, uh, which uh, have hard, larger valuations and, um, um, and a smaller percent of equities. But right now, because of the pandemic, um, uh, many companies are, are reducing their valuations, uh, which kind of give, gives us a chance uh, to enter as well. So since we typically only look at um, um, projects that are around uh, 5 million USD uh, up or down, uh, so um, gave us quite a few opportunities as well. So um, I see the uh, connection between what uh, Syria said and, and also, um, um, I'm sorry, what was, uh, uh, Ivalo said. So yeah, sorry if I, if I um, <laughs> get the names wrong. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Charles. And Henry Gang, you also have um, a comment on that? Absolutely. So I think I, I recently uh, <clears throat> did a presentation, prepared presentation. There are a couple observations. I, well, there are many observations, but I just pointed out two. I do agree with Sierra. Uh, so in terms of uh, central bank digital currency, CBDC, um, I've personally been bullish uh, in terms of sort of the uh, 
explosiveness in that sector, in that area. It's just the fact that if you look at last year when the Libra project came out, literally around this time of the year, I think June 2019, I think it caused a lot of central bankers around the world a little uh, concern, right? If you look at the project on service, it's extremely, um, how do I say it? It's very um, aggressive, um, very ambitious. Um, so, you know, I think the bankers, central bankers, I think this project might be the central bank of central banks. So, um, you know, I think that gave a little push. And then obviously with this pandemics, uh, if you look at initially happened in China and Wuhan across the country, uh, China has been very uh, forefront in terms of digital, not digital currency, but digital payment with WeChat and Alipay. So if you go to China, very rare, well, except people who are a little bit older using cash, most people are using um, apps, you know, whether it's WeChat Pay or Alipay. Um, you know, with the pandemics, it actually speeded that up because the virus can be spread even with uh, uh, fiat. So I think those projects I've seen sort of their pilots in uh, China, a couple other countries. Um, also, I would also know, I think supply chains are broken around the world as a result of the pandemics. If you look at, we can get an Uber on demand. Why can we get consumer goods on demand? So if you look at the supply chains, each uh, pieces is silo. Manufacturer have their own silo data. Um, you know, the consumer have their own silo data. The uh, storehouse, store warehouse have their own silo data. So I see sort of the blockchain will be moving uh, very quickly, or there are a lot of projects going to be tackling a lot of the uh, supply chain issues. So those are the obs uh, two observations I made among many. Um, I, I just pointed out during my presentation, just want to uh, bring it to the audience here. Thank you, Henry. And Kishan, uh, do you have any comments on the current situation, your observation, or maybe recent investment cases you would like to share? Uh, yeah, so we uh, we have not changed our investment thesis significantly, uh, uh, you know, during COVID. Uh, obviously, our focus has been predominantly in helping our existing portfolio companies sustain and extend runway. Uh, so largely, uh, we have, uh, you know, redeployed or rather we have deployed some of our some of our dry powder that we were keeping for new investments uh, into helping uh, our existing startups, uh, you know, extend runway, right? So, uh, so that's been our top priority. Uh, second priority uh, is uh, is obviously looking at new deals and uh, continue to invest in, uh, in in interesting opportunities. So we have seen some really interesting uh, companies in the ed tech and health uh, tech space, and we are actively closing one deal in the ed tech space right now. Uh, look in the in the fintech and crypto, uh, you know, crypto startups are, are, are in a very nascent stage in in the southeast South Asian region. I suppose uh, you know there are lots of other uh, other interesting uh, consumer uh, health tech ed tech companies that are that are really focused on solving uh, bigger issues. So 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 in in, in the fintech space, uh, we haven't really seen much deals uh, coming in the fintech space. Uh, uh, definitely nothing in crypto. Uh, but fintech, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, we uh, we're seeing uh, one or two deals in the payments and lending. Uh, however, recently, uh, just before COVID, uh, you know, we closed a deal where we have connected uh, five million farmers uh, to uh, uh, to factories. Uh, now, essentially, uh, banks can be part of that platform and lend uh, to four million farmers. So these were unbanked farmers. Uh, suddenly have come into a platform where, you know, the banks are 4 million new, uh, new uh, consumers to whom they can lend uh, based on the transactions that these farmers are doing right now. Uh, so that could, that could really morph into, a, into an interesting fintech play. Uh, but like I said, you know, we are very early at crypto. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so we're keeping our thesis uh, relatively unchanged right now. Thank you, Kishan. And Dawu, uh, what are your observations and current experiences you would like to share? Okay, I guess for us at EcoVC, um, our investment process hasn't changed. Um, like what um, Kishan said, um, initially during the pandemic, we had focused most of our efforts on uh, portfolio companies, just ensuring that they had extended runway to continue to operate. But we've also been very, been very active in assessing companies. I think right now we have about 10 companies we're assessing for investment. I think three out of those 10 are in the FinTech space. Um, there's definitely been a high appetite for investments right now. Um, and traction pre-COVID um, has shown to be an important yardstick to also gauge how 
um, most of these companies will respond, um, well, most of the users or customers of the companies will respond during COVID. Um, I guess the pandemic has also kind of like allowed companies know whether they're a daily multivitamin. We say this in-house, something where people have to take every day or are you just the uh, once in a while painkiller? Um, so they've known how important they are in the food chain. Um, we've also seen that COVID has shown the need to also accelerate um, growth in fintech and digitization of um, in transactions. Um, regardless of the pandemic or not, we remain very thorough in our, in our process and I don't think that will change. Um, although we as investors just taking a closer look and stress testing assumptions further just to see if, you know, the uh, fundamentals and technicals make sense for us at the end of the day. Um, in terms of recent cases of investments, we haven't made any investments personally um, right now, but we are actively assessing. But in terms of fintech in general, um, there's been a lot of investments going on in that space. Um, I mean, just today, Chipa Cash um, announced um, its um, $13.8 million Series A, um, you know, and in 2019 alone, about $555 million were raised by African fintech companies, um, and 50% of those companies were based in Nigeria. So investments are still happening. Uh, assessments are still happening. I think, I think right now is really the best time um, for investors to really, really scout for proper investments. Um, and also, like someone mentioned, valuations have definitely been cut um, by at least 50%, like just making it more realistic. You can't just be pricing anyhow right now. So those are my, those are my observations. Gitavo and uh, Henry Essi, uh, what uh, would be your observation on the current uh, situation? And what is your investment target uh, currently and maybe criteria for investment in the current situation? Uh, I'm going to echo what, what everybody's been saying, but I'll, I'll frame it in a couple of uh, areas. First is the in, um, investment side. On the investment side, what I, what I worry about is that people are not seeing the, um, the, the, the true impact of COVID. In my opinion, you see at least two or three years of death in investments. There will be very, very few investments for the next two to three years. I've been through the 2000 crash and I've seen when investments dry up. And what's happening right now is everybody's still assessing the, the impact of COVID. And they, uh, they haven't yet seen the full impact through all the, uh, through, through all the, 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 uh, uh, the, the flows of, uh, of uh, well, basically the, the, the whole global uh, relationship between all different companies, as, as some of them are starting to crash, the others are, are going to crash more and more. It's gonna be a domino effect and domino effect is barely starting. So what we're going to see is the, from the LP side all the way to the GP side um, and, and even the, uh, the uh, angel investors is that uh, everybody's going to retrench, uh, double down on their current investments, cash is king, as some of you guys have said already. And uh, the most important thing is revenue and ensuring that you're going to survive. So it's, and, and I'm not seeing that yet, um, but I think it's going to happen very, very soon. Um, so that's, that's on the investment side. We got very lucky. We, uh, we sold one of our portfolio companies in January. It was in the food tech and it would have been crushed by COVID. So we got super lucky. The other investments that we've got, what we're seeing is the, one of the key uh, uh, survival, uh, um, uh, um, I would say, uh, parameters of, uh, of a startup is um, the, the, the founders in a situation of, uh, of, of distress and, and, and tension right now. And the founders, when, when they're very strong, uh, will get their companies to survive. So uh, make sure the, the, you don't have um, issues between the, 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 the founders that, um, and, and that's more important actually than the, than the, uh, the current uh, business model of the company. They've got to be able to transform and move and, and do these kinds of things. 
the on the um, crypto side, what I'm seeing is uh, uh, a huge positive, as opposed to the COVID negatives. Is uh, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, as Alexander said, and as Sarah said, also I'm seeing um, um, many comp many uh, uh, funds and uh, and banks um, going for the custodianships in crypto and uh, and uh, our, our uh, portfolio company that's doing the hedge fund software is seeing huge demand. Uh, so so they're super happy. Thank you, Henry. And uh, Alexander, uh, do you have any observation on how the situation could evolve and what could be in you, in your focus of attention? Maybe um, uh, what uh, uh, particular investment criteria would you like to highlight in your current focus of attention when you assess project for your own portfolio? So I would say there's really, the focus did, sh did shift. Um, it is really on something very practical, right? Can you survive? Are you going to get revenue? The valuations also are a bit um, smaller, as everyone said. Uh, I think there's a shift that's happening in the crypto and blockchain space. As Sarah said, blockchain is more general. We're seeing very big companies, right? Like Amazon, Microsoft, uh, patenting blockchain technology, many big companies in the supply chain uh, just making partnerships here and there. So big companies, governments, are tr I, I've noticed crypto and blockchain, that is for sure. But it is more blockchain than crypto, and it's hard when you're deep in crypto to sometimes invest in blockchain. The um, wild west of crypto, the wild west days, they're still a bit here, but I think they're counted. They won't last for long. Um, big, big exchanges, for example, Coinbase, they start to have to cooperate with government agencies like the DEA, the IRS. And in the past, these exchanges, Coinbase recently, I think they made a fucked up move. They told they would be selling a tracking software to the IRS and the DEA. And of course, privacy is very important in crypto. And so two thirds of Coinbase users said they would be willing to leave the exchange. In the past, Coinbase might not have realized that, but it was a good exchange and there wasn't lots of good alternatives. But nowadays, you have tons of quality exchanges that you can go to. And of course, if these exchanges treat users' privacy differently than Coinbase, maybe because they're not operating on American soil and they don't have to comply, well, then these users will go elsewhere. We're also seeing more institutional investors and these guys, as Sarah said, they require more premium service. They want insurance. And so there's a big market for hundreds of millions of insurance, uh, big companies that can execute trades with very tight spread rapidly um, that are really starting to emerge to cater to this new uh, clientele. So regarding investments, I think just be very practical um, the market is shifting, the big money is coming in, all the institutional investors. That doesn't mean you can't make money if you're retail investors, but it certainly will be quite hard. If you're in the right groups, you might be able to see the opportunities, um, but it's hard. So keep, stay informed with the news and try to follow where the money is going. Thank you, Alexander. And Sierra, would you like to comment uh, any a recommendation for serial entrepreneurs and for investors on your site in the current environment? Uh, what should be in the focus of attention? Well, in this new landscape, many investors have been attracted to DeFi, decentralized finance platforms, due to certain companies such as BlockFi, which are incentivizing investors with high interest payments and also providing lending services as Keyshawn and Alexander have mentioned already. But I think it's important that investments simply do not mirror incumbent financial institutional products by simply replacing them with crypto products. I mean, we have seen what we learned from the 2018 crisis with derivatives, fractional lending systems and revolving credit loans could eventually implode. And so we are in a very tenuous situation currently with the COVID crisis. So 
right now, despite that the new investment process is primarily incentivized by high interest payments in crypto, I think we should consider further long-term implications of such a model. Um, beyond 2020, I think blockchain apps that will continue, that will provide ease of use for mass adoption and governments will continue to launch their own native digital currencies. And um, during this lockdown, we have already seen local governments launch temporary regional currencies to be utilized by their residents. And I think this has very great potential. Thank you. And um, uh, Ivailo, uh, what is currently in the focus of your attention? What are the key criteria for you to assess the project as uh, uh, attractive for your portfolio? Um, so in the in the world of blockchain and crypto, we're looking at sort of the layer which is required for institutional players to come in and start engaging with the with the asset class. And also, if you believe that you know all the securities will be tokenized one day, and we're going to move away from the current settlement processes into into sort of more up to date. Uh, we look mostly at what are the companies that are well positioned to build that middle layer. I don't think we're ready for the application layer yet and the consumer side of things, but the middle layer, your custody, your trading venues and, and, and everything that comes around it, the insurance and all that uh, is, quite, uh, is quite interesting to us. Uh, so we've been looking at that quite actively. Um, very engaged with uh, DeFi. Um, I think on the surface of it, it still feels a little bit like a toy but actually every, every good thing starts a little bit like that and, 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 and progresses into something quite, uh, quite, uh, quite strong. So, so very uh, interested in a number of DeFi projects that are coming out. Um, in terms of um, just general uh, eligibility for investment, I think, you know, as Henry said, it's very important to have founders that can navigate through a difficult situation. We, we invest very early on. And so more often than not, founders is pretty much what we have to go on because products are quite nascent and, uh, you know, effectively, there's not a lot to evaluate. Yes, you can evaluate the plan and the idea, but, you know, it really is down to the founder to execute and to deliver ultimately a business out of it. And so, you know, uh, we, we, always, we always have, and, and even more so now, we look for uh, strong founders that we think can navigate the difficulties that come with this. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you know, a sort of a clear part of, of, of what the company does over the coming years, uh, I, I think, and again, agreeing with, uh, with, with Henry here, uh, I think the, the, the effects are not yet fully fully known. I mean, if we look at the 2008 crisis, interestingly, the, the VC funding dried out with a delay. So we haven't seen a huge dry out of funding today, even though we are seeing a decline. But I think if we were to follow what happened in 2008, the really the draft in, in funding is coming, you know, a year later. Um, and so we're looking for companies that can either, um, you know, prove that they can get to sort of a pivotal point to raise their next round, even with the difficulty in the funding environment, or get to a profitability state where they don't need to raise a, a, another round. But we are very conscious of the fact that actually things will get tougher in within the next year, more so than they are now. Thank you. And Charles, uh, do you have any specific criteria uh, for assessing the project at the current environment? Or what is new? Or specific to the current situation, you are muted. Ah, oh, we still don't hear you. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I agree with many of the other speakers as well. Um, we look at companies, we, we've been a lot more um, realistic. Um, we look at companies with uh, longer runaways. So. There are companies with great ideas and have operated for a while, but then um, they might be running out of cash very soon um, in the next month or so. Um, um, and, and without the pandemic, we might be interested in it, but um, as of now, we, we just want the companies to focus on um, survival. And another thing is that um, if they have a lower burn rate uh, per month, um, this is something that we would like to see as well. So um, what we find is that uh, a lot of, a lot more we, we are diverging some of our attention uh, less to to blockchain actually, but more to iOS uh, uh, 
uh, projects. So um, typically these uh, uh, projects um, mostly related to application, um, uh, like mobile applications, and they have lower cost and they have a longer runway and they can, some of them can even operate without uh, revenue uh, for a couple of months, although they don't have any, um, you know, although they won't uh, see a, a return in at least until a year or so. So, um, but yeah, uh, it's just been a lot more conservative in terms of uh, looking at projects. So, yeah. Thank you. And Kishan, uh, what is, uh, uh, what's new uh, in terms of your investment criteria? What is in the focus of your attention when you select startups for your own portfolio? You know, like, like what the other speakers said, you know, our, our investment uh, evaluation criteria has not changed uh, significantly be, uh, simply because we think, uh, you know, the fundamentals will, will, will remain same, uh, you know, for evaluating uh, early stage ventures. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we ask, we ask, we still ask the standard questions of, you know, are you solving a real problem? I mean, you know, are you going after a, a, a market that's, that's, that's reasonably large enough? Uh, but, you know, also we ask uh, some loaded questions now, uh, especially with this, uh, with this pandemic, we, uh, we evaluate to see how, how sustainable these businesses are and they can be uh, because eventually the whole, uh, uh, the, the, the thesis of, uh, you know, venture funded businesses that burn for a very long period without getting into profitability is, is a huge problem for us uh, because, uh, you know, this was unexpected and suddenly, you know, in the last two months, you probably saw many startups that could have succeeded have failed, right? Simply because, uh, you know, bad uh, financial management, you know, significant uh, burn, uh, you know, and a very short runway that was unplanned. So this is a question that we start throwing into people's heads and founders, and we'd really like to figure out, uh, and they'd like to tell us how they'd solve a situation like this going forward. So, uh, so I think that is our, our, our primary question that we ask founders, you know, if you, uh, if this, if this pandemic were to extend for another 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, uh, you know, if your customers don't come back, uh, we've seen that happen to some of our companies, you know, I mean, the companies that were doing well in the B2B space uh, suddenly lost uh, predominantly all their customers overnight. So you have to uh, uh, rethink your strategy. Uh, you know, you have to cut cost. Uh, but, but the good thing out of all of this is uh, suddenly, you know, all the founders have realized, hey, uh, you know, a lot of the costs that, that we were spending, uh, you know, is, is, is truly unnecessary. We could have really uh, stayed without spending this money a long time ago and we could have extended the runway. So we, we'd like our found, our new founders who are coming into our office and pitching to us uh, to be very cognizant that this is an important element, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, yeah, I mean, in fintech, I mean, I don't have much comments, but, you know, overall, uh, you know, this, is, this is the kind of uh, uh, sort of evaluation that we are asking our founders. Thank you. And uh, Charles and uh, Henry, Esley, could you also uh, add uh, something on your part? Uh, do you have any specifics in terms of um, investment criteria for companies? Yes, as I said earlier, uh, I, I think the, the, the real troubles are yet to start. And I wouldn't yet even compare it to the 2008 crash. I would compare it to the 2000 crash for those of you who were around in the 2000 crash. It was a massacre for tech companies, only for tech companies. But I would say that this pandemic is going to be a massacre for everything. Um, the, the way I'm investing now and I'm looking at investments is twofold. One, of course, we're looking at uh, companies that are going to generate revenues very quickly and that are good in a, uh, in a distressed environment. So they don't necessarily have to be tech companies. I'm looking at, agric ag at agri, for example, agricultural investments, um, which are um, very uh, local. And localism, um, even in, in, in crypto, is an interesting thing, as Sarah said and, uh, and others. Uh, localism is, is, is the name of the game to me right now. And the other um, investment area that is interesting is 
if you consider that that right now it's going to be a big problem for the next couple of years, if not two to, if even for close to three years, what you can do is invest um, very early stage in those companies that necessitate a long gestation period for those three years, where you're going to start, you know, those companies that start in a distressed uh, environment, like in 2007, Airbnb, et cetera. So you can start uh, with a few people, you have uh, very little cost, uh, your runway is very long, and you have the time to actually build up your product until uh, better days happen. And then you'll be perfectly positioned to really write the, the, the growth. Thank you. And Henry, you also wanted to comment? Yeah, so I just uh, make a very high level general comment. I think there are a lot of things been said uh, for my fellow panelists. I think uh, Henry made an interesting comment. You know, he, he sounded great. What a great name, Henry. Um, but I think you ended up with the I, I ended up with the Y, but I, I call it the C. Now, uh, the interesting thing was this is my third uh, official bear market. Uh, my first one was dot com, then the financial crisis in 08, then this is the third one. This is the most unique one of all. I think about a month ago, I heard Buffett in his uh, investor uh, annual shareholder meeting online, he said it best. He is 89 years old, turning 90. He said he has see not seen anything like this. You know, Buffett had probably seen a lot. And if he is 90, he hasn't seen anything like this. Whoever it's alive can claim that we have seen anything like this will be uh, sort of uh, gibberish, in my opinion. I looked back in terms of the pandemic, the history of pandemics, and how it affected human history. The last one that was closest to it was about a little over 100 years ago was the Spanish influenza. This is in 1918. That one lasted a little under, like roughly three years. There were three major spikes or breakouts in different periods, resurgence. So now we are actually seeing it. You know, if you see a global lockdown about three months ago, um, you know, so country by country, they're all taking uh, different precautions. Uh, some have actually restarted. Um, you know, in the US we have, uh, you know, we have seen some spikes already in terms of in the Southern states. Uh, China is a great example. If you look at Beijing and Wuhan three months, or six months or five months ago, it was terrible. Uh, they did a tremendous job. Now we're seeing spikes again, and outbreaks in Beijing. Um, so, so, you know, I think we're going to see some waves. Um, I don't think this is going to end anytime soon. So when you have an outbreak, they're taking very um, aggressive actions in terms of containing it. So, so, you know, in terms of people thinking about a V-shaped recovery, yeah, maybe temporarily, but there might be multiple V-shapes. So I think for those, my little uh, uh, humble advice with startup is, um, you know, be nimble. Um, I think another one of my panelists said it best, uh, be, uh, um, you know, be, uh, you know, stay on the forefront and then just be nimble in terms of making pivots if you need to. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, it, it's not the best startup will survive. It's the, the, you know, the team that with the most nimble making quick decisions and then uh, making adjustments um, that, that will ultimately survive. So, so I wish a lot of uh, the startups all the best in, in this uh, difficult period for uh, all of us. Thank you. And uh, Taiwan, would you like to comment on um, anything uh, on your special criteria you have at the moment? Well, I feel like in terms of having criteria for assessments, you, we, we all know there will always be risks with whatever investments you make, the market or regulation or even execution risk. Um, we, we, we try to be quite focused with how we assess companies, pandemic or not. Um, but I think what will be salient or key, the barest minimum will be, you know, having a scalable business model that has a compelling uh, value proposition. Uh, founder resilience and execution is also very important. Um, founders need to be practical, realistic, and be able to adjust to whatever conditions are being thrown at them. Um, and having that survival mentality, because at the end of the day, like Henry said, survival is key, whether you have to pivot or you know, change business models at the end of the day. Um, also having a good target addressable market and a competitive mood is one of the assessments and um, criteria we would also look out for. Um, revenue generation potential. Um, ideally, we like to, even though we are 
seed early stage, um, we still like to see some level of revenue traction, uh, no matter how small, just definitely proving that, you know, your customers or users can pay. Um, and um, what else? And having a strong and exceptional team, because at the end of the day, the people are the ones who make up the business. Without people, without a team, there's really no business. Um, there's really no one to drive your strategy forward. Um, but I guess another advice I'll also give um, founders and entrepreneurs is, you know, just never be ashamed to make business calls that are necessary for survival and extension of runway um, for your company. Um, that would be all for me. Okay, thank you. And um, so um, we go to the final session, uh, the final session of our pitch competitions. And um, I would like to start with Claudio. Um, could you start with a brief introduction of yourself and um, share your pitch deck with us? Uh, hello. Uh, so I'm a key international key account manager for Sunday's Life International. And I have a background in finance. I've been in uh, JP Morgan and other co uh, financial corporations. Then I moved to for uh, three years in, uh, in, uh, in tech and I worked in uh, startups uh, for uh, blockchain Bitcoin. Now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fully dedicated to the Sun's Going project for Sun's Life International. Okay, do you want me to start uh, with a. Yes, uh, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, so this is the Soundscoin uh, Sound project, and our, uh, our com company uh, aim is the one of. Uh, uh, we don't see your um, uh, your slides, so could you launch uh, a demonstration of the slides? Sorry, you don't see the screen, huh? Yeah. Okay, I need to share my screen again. Okay, can you see that now? And not yet. Can you now see I'm that? Loading. Yeah. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so uh, Sam's going uh, and thank you for uh, for uh, for your interest and your attention. Um, just let me. Okay, our company uh, aim uh, is to improve the quality of life of, uh, of our client by providing healthy product and services to to all of them, and uh, we created Sam's Coin in order to do that uh, independently from traditional uh, payment system. We encountered, encountered a, a problem, which is that two uh, billion of our potential clients worldwide suffer from financial exclusion, and also that we need to process daily uh, thousands of small to medium payments. We see that as a big problem that uh, could be transformed into, into a big opportunity. We uh, identify a blockchain technology as the solution, and we created the whole Samus coin infrastructure or, over the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, in order basically to transfer value um, anytime and anywhere in any given moment. We, we like this solution so much that we decided this one to be the uh, only tool we use to transfer money, uh, sending and receiving payment outside of uh, India. Now, about timing and economical and uh, political uh, instability, we believe facilitate change and, and a new um, uh, people behavior, and also the uh, multi-level uh, marketing to over the overall one, uh, it's growing uh, consistently in this economical uh, period. Right now we are under 90 uh, billion dollars, to be precise, and also the cumulative market capitalization is a substantial number. So we believe uh, joining all of those things together right now is uh, it's a pretty good timing to, 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 to present this, uh, this kind of technology and solution to, to our clients. A few uh, details about uh, Sam's Life. Basically, we closed the 2019 with uh, more than 14 million euros and a network of uh, 80, something less than 80,000 users and members active. And to give you an idea, uh, we are now entering uh, the uh, more than proportional growth. And you can see our main competitors, they are on uh, more than $80 billion, the main competitor, uh, to Nova a year. And now these are the products that we have already made. And then we have a Sanus wallet, multi, multi currency. Obviously, we have the token. Then we have a point of sale. And then also we have a Sanus Explorer. Very soon we are releasing a map where we will have all the business partner and activity that will accept uh, Sanus coin as a payment system to purchase their services and product. 
We use Sanus Coin to internationalize our business, and this is the model. Those that you see in this slide are the main players. Sanus Life Admin is the company we created to manage the whole transaction of the token to the different players. Trading partner, for instance, is the logistic distributor and partner in each uh, different country outside of, uh, of Europe. And uh, the team, the, found, the management team of Samus Life International are also the, the managers of the uh, Samus Coin project, and those are the main founders. And also, the one you see here are our partners. So we have uh, CoinLex for the uh, tax and law regarding crypto, SBS Legal, uh, it's a leader in the, in the commercial law. And then in Bitcoin is our software house on the side of uh, Bitcoin technology to create the Samus Coin. A few numbers to close the presentation. We are aiming and expecting to reach by 2025 500 million euros to Nova with a network of uh, around uh, approximately 500,000 distributors, which uh, with all the clients and all the, 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 the group of people involved in the network, uh, you're going to have uh, 5 million people uh, uh, getting to know Sanus Coin and getting to use Sanus Coin over, uh, over a year. Last uh, is uh, we are aiming to collect 350,000 euros right now, which we will invest uh, a third and a third and a third in token technology and uh, business internationalization and uh, growing of the community and token uh, uh, R&D. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudio. And our next project uh, to present, um, Jacob, could you please introduce yourself and your project? Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure uh, to present Seymour Grey before everyone. Uh, myself, Jacob George, I am the founder and CEO of Seymour Grey. Seymour Grey is an AI powered marketing automation suite. Uh, with that note, let me just take you through the presentation. Yeah, just go ahead. We see it full screen. Thank you. So basically, we deploy AI capabilities for intelligent e-commerce engagement for various brands. So I'm just taking a very practical use case, which all of us could be facing. Uh, as any any e-commerce company uh, would be, you know, facing this particular question. I'm just taking Miss Tina as a prospect customer. Should I reach out to Ms. Tina on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Friday? Uh, how about uh, reaching her morning tea break or late night? Should I send her an email, SMS, app or browser notification or reach her directly on social media or engage her when she visits my website? And what could be the best product or content that fits her? How potential Tina is as a customer and how much I should spend on her as a marketer. Now, we address the pain points faced by four key stakeholders. For brands, we provide an omni-channel platform, creating a seamless experience across devices and channels. And for marketers, we provide an all-in-one talk to another platform. And for business owners, the platform provides precise consumer insights, saving a lot of time and money. And for the consumers, the engine provides highly contextual intelligent campaigns powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So this is the product roadmap. We have the customer acquisition happening across various channels, web, mobile, and social. The engine stacks the demographic data, campaign engagement data, and the web analytical piece of data. And it has got a machine learning layer, which helps the marketer to identify the right audience, the right content, and the time favorability for a campaign deployment and through the right channel. And proof of concept. Now, this is a live data from one of our customers. They have compared tra traditional campaign deployments versus against Seymour intelligent notifications. Average consumer response rate, there is a performance uplift of 10%. Average click response, there is 75% uplift on clicks. Revenue generation per thousand notifications, there is 173 percentage uplift. Average order value, there's a slight dip of around 10 percent because you know once we start deploying ML and AI based campaigns, we see more number of transactions happening. 
so per ticket value should be could be coming down orders per thousand notifications there is 200 percentage uplift cost of deployment almost like 67 percentage more money we were charging to the customers till the customers were much more happy as against a traditional channel marketing automation market size estimated to be around 5.6 billion us dollar and the addressable market size is 1.25 billion and 33 percent 33 million usd is what we plan to achieve we are the first company in asia to offer ml based predictive intelligent notifications across emails and browser notifications hyper personalized campaigns 100 plus, 100 plus billable customers in 40 months of our operation we have got two technology awards and we are incubated at the prestigious indian institute of management india cold coach this is a preview of the dashboard and the market traction currently we this is the growth we have a churn rate as low as 2 percentage major brands we work with a uh, couple of well known brands in india like oila and few brands from even uh, singapore this is the business canvas model the key value proposition as i explained is into a and ml based campaign creation automated audience and channel selection and time favorability based deployments major customers would come from e-commerce bfsi education hospitality and retail and obviously the revenue streams are basically from usage based and device based the competitive landscape we have standalone solutions for each of the channels lot of players so where we come here is there are only few players who got an aa and ml layer this is exactly where we position as a central part the leadership team we are a core team of three members and we have an advisory mod uh, from the University of Miami, uh, Dr. Johnson Joseph, and from IAM, Professor Kayur Pirani. And these are our revenue targets. We envision to achieve 33 million by 2223 US dollars. And the deployment plan, we target an investment of 2 billion US dollars. Mainly, to, it is going to be deployed into talent acquisition for AI and business development additional market penetration uh, as well as for finally into technology upgradation, mainly into service application level optimization and additional module additions. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Brian, could you also introduce your project with the pitch deck? Thank thanks for having me. And thanks for letting me listen to all the input so far. So my name is Brian McNulty. I am the CEO of FAC, I just get this started. We are digitalizing the funds value chain using blockchain distributed ledger technology. So me personally, I've been in the funds industry for 25 years. I've been exclusively working on blockchain for over five years. And probably more importantly, I've been an entrepreneur running portfolios of companies through all of the crashes that we've just been talking about and learned an awful lot through those processes that I'm hoping were put into practice as we, we, we hit this, uh, this crisis we're in right now. And I agree with the, the speakers earlier that we, the, the worst is still to come. So we, we had to move quickly to uh, change how we were, we were working. So what we're really looking at here is there's a massive problem in the, the funds industry. The funds value chain is, is, is particularly well known to be clunky. It's not moved to be as, a, as electronic as the, the equities markets or, or several other markets. And there's a, an overextended value chain with numerous intermediaries taking a slices of cost out of that value chain, but also bringing risk and bringing a needs for reconciliations and so on. And that's a, that's a, a $10 trillion industry to be clear here. It's a massive industry. And for many, many years, people have been asking and trying to do something about it and failing uh, in dramatic uh, style in many instances. Along comes DLT. And in the case of uh, people saying it's a, a, a tech looking for a, a, a business problem, well, you know, this was a business problem that, that really could benefit from DLT. And that's what we've grasped. So basically what we're doing is we're tokenizing the fund asset, tokenizing the cash holding, uh, and mobilizing them onto a private register and then allowing parties to, to trade digitally, therefore removing not just the need for the reconciliation, but removing 
the, the need for massive amounts of operational work that gets done on all sides, so in the fund service providers and the fund manager. A lot of it collapses to zero, and a lot of it gets reduced significantly. So what we're really doing is it's not, it's not just cost. This is, a, this is a revolution happening in front of our eyes here. There's an opportunity for the fund managers to completely change how business is done in funds trading. So they can cut out those uh, massive fees from the value chain. They can cut away their own operational efficiency. But by having that immediacy of settlement in the trade, it means that they can have immediate position updates. Uh, there's, no, there's no delays. It means that they can then do, they can act upon that data. And it also gives them a new platform for launching funds, which is we're crying out for as well to to cut into the costs around distribution. But it won't work unless you can get the fund service providers who have got a lot to lose, they've got a lot of revenue to lose, unless you make it attractive for them to come on the journey. So that's what we've been doing. So we've been doing this now for five years. Uh, so I've been in this space, uh, aside from two years as uh, on the Exco for R3, looking at other things. We've been working with the fund service providers and the fund managers and the regulators to see how on earth can we make this happen? How can we come up with a solution that means that everybody wins? And that's really what we've been doing. So for we, we failed five years ago by trying to do it with the fund service providers first. We failed three years ago by trying to get the fund managers to build something together. And then two years ago, we decided to just go and do it. So I, I left our three many uh, several backers and we got cracking with building the product, then the order is very important. So we basically got the regulators and investment bodies on board. So we've now got the, we're in the FCA sandbox, we've got investment association, depository association, money markets association, and then we got the fund managers involved. So our advisory group is Aegon, Alliance, Bernstein, Columbia, Aberdeen, LNG, MNG, Leg Mason, UBS, and so on. And basically, we then started the process of saying, now we've got the regulators, now we've got a product, and now we've got your customers. Come on, fund service providers, who's going to go first? And we're really grateful to the forward-thinking team in Royal Bank of Canada, who undertook a proof of concept to show that, yes, indeed, we can collapse the, the, uh, the operational side from a fund service provider's point of view. And now we're moving into a paid pilot starting in August. We've got HSBC, and on Friday, fingers crossed, one of the biggest global custodians will be joining the two of them. And we've got one fund manager launching a real fund with real money in this pilot and another six at least will be simulating. So we are raising 1.5 to continue the journey. Uh, we've got uh, 900, we need another 0.6 and we've got, uh, we're, we're in the process of deciding who our final partner is alongside R3 who will be the operator of our service. Just at a high level, this is an eye-watering opportunity. The reason why it's not been done before is it's incredibly uh, large hill we're pushing up. We're not trying to shy away from that. We're not trying to sugarcoat it. There's legal regulatory considerations as a major program of work ahead, but we have got the capability, the drive, and also now the momentum to keep going from where we are. And as you can see in that final bullet in the, the underneath target there, the revenue forecasts for a very small part of the UK market and the first step of what is our journey through the value chain on a global solution is incredibly rich for those that want to come and join us and invest. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, I hope that all our investor participants have already submitted their evaluation forms and we can start our feedback and Q&A session. So um, Alexander, do you have any questions or feedback to all the projects or to particular ones? Sure. So the one I was most impressed with is C Mercury. I, like we said before, we want to be very practical, and I think the I really liked the numbers, right? Because one question I had during the presentation was, how good is the product? And showing the numbers was uh, very good. So uh, this is the one of the most excited about. The the last one with Brian, I, it sounds very interesting, very big, but right now, since times are a bit uncertain, maybe this would be something that I would like to see more confirmation and invest in a later round. And for the first one, it, I wasn't too sure. Uh, I, there was something I didn't get, I think. Um, 
uh, at one point during the presentation, you said you closed 14 million in 2019. And I wasn't sure what that was, what that number was referring to. So maybe, I don't know if you could maybe explain what that number was, but overall good pitches and I really like C Mercury. Yeah, please exchange contact in the chat uh, with each other for follow-on communication. You can do it directly as well. And Brian, would you like to comment? I think, I think that was a question for Claudio. Okay, Claudio, for Claudio. Uh, yes, it was for me. The 14 and something is the total turnover at the end of 2019, is how much uh, money we made with Sounds Life International. Okay, well, that, that's pretty good. And so I was kind of confused because 14 million turnover sounds a lot compared to a 350K raise. No. Yeah, yeah, because we, 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 we can uh, finance our project. Majority of it, a majority of the technological infrastructure we have already completed. But what we are looking for right now, it's uh, a feedback from, uh, from, uh, from key players around the world. Because we are uh, the, now, what we need to do, where the majority of money are going to go, is the expansion. Where we are, we are using this technology also to uh, grow our business. You see, so it's not mainly money that we are going for; it's more a potentially key partners that will introduce us to potential key distributors and key logistic partners. That's what we are really after. Thank yeah. You. I, I do get your point. I was just a bit surprised because I mean, raising money is always like a compromise between moving faster with the money you're getting, but also it slows you down when you're raising money. And so raising a 350K when you're already dealing with millions, it just sounded a bit weird, but I do get that you want more policy partners maybe and uh, see if uh, people are interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. And Sierra, would you like to comment? Yes, I mean, I thought all the presentations were quite interesting. Um, I was quite impressed by Claudia's very quick, compact presentation. I was a little bit confused about what the Explorer was. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the Explorer because it seems like they're making a wallet coin POS and an Explorer. And I, was, I wasn't sure what the Explorer was in terms of um, his company. As far as Jacob's eMercury, I'm wondering if this is going to be a B2C or a B2B company. I mean, it sounds like what you're doing is very close to um, another company called Growth Intelligence, which sort of targets um, who they could market for certain types of sales. So I was sort of interested if you were just, um, if it was going to be B2B or B2C. And for Brian, for FAC, um, I mean, your experience sounds quite impressive. Um, I'm just wondering for 1.5 million, like how long would that one runway be? So those are my three questions for the present presentations. Should I, should I start? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so thank you, Sarah, for your question. The um, Samsung Explorer is a part of our uh, technological infrastructure of Samsung, which we have already developed. The Samsung wallet is just a crypto wallet, multi-currency, Bitcoin and Samsung coin. The, um, the Samsung Explorer is a, like a, a, a blockchain explorer. It's basically a blockchain explorer that can track every transaction such as Bitcoin transaction and also Sanus coin transaction on the blockchain. It's basically a platform that uh, allows the user to uh, verify and validate uh, a given transaction in Sanus coin to prove that it's really uh, decentralized. Just to, to answer the question on the, the runway. So the, the raise will get through the pilot and the, the initiation of the adoption plan with the fund manager who's launching the fund for real in the pilot. It's a, it'll last us 10 months with a four month buffer. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacob, any comments from you or? Yeah, uh, basically our focus is currently on B2C uh, because B2B is, um, uh, <laughs> because you see more large enterprises, who, you know, very aggressively working on the B2B front. So we are focused uh, on SMEs. That is exact focus at this point. Small and medium enterprises is our current focus. Uh, but India, we are also working with the medium to large enterprises also. They do come and work with us. 
so but globally if you take i i think we should we want to remain our focus at this point between b2b b2c and small and medium enterprises uh thank you and uh charles do you have comments um, yes so uh for the first project um my question is um why is it only focused on emua markets um why couldn't it be globally since it's a um um since it's a, a digital wallet, um, I assume it can be used everywhere. Um, and for this, the second one, um, a question is, is there a timeline to um, uh, the project development? And a third one is uh, on the legal considerations, uh, could you uh, tell us more about the specifics and, and more about uh, this, your specialty on it? Hello? So, uh, hello, can I answer the first question? Yes, yes, sure. Oh, okay, because the other two, I, I couldn't hear them very well. I don't know if it was only me, but I had a, I, I could hear it very low. Um, okay, but the first question was regarding EMEA. Um, I might have not been very clear. We are actually using the Samus coin uh, infrastructure to expand outside EMEA, to go internationally. So your point was right. Maybe I wasn't uh, clear enough, but it, it's, it's exactly what we use to go international. Is to use the same currency for 190 countries uh, around the globe to, to be able to transfer any given amount, even small micro payments, because uh, it's the nature of our business is to, to basically pay weekly a small amount all around the globe. And that with the normal uh, uh, payment system, it's very expensive and it's almost impossible. So that's why we needed to find a solution with the blockchain, blockchain technology. Thank you. Any further uh, answers? Some Charles, Charles, was the regulatory question uh, for, for myself? Yeah, so, so like specifics on legal considerations and, and the specialty on it. So, yeah. It's one of the hard parts. It is. It is a big part of what, what we do. I mean, I've got, we've got the blessing of being inside the, the R3 ecosystem where R3 are engaging 40, 50 regulators around the world. So we sort of take the, the we, we've got a framework that we're working within, but specifically within our use case, we formed a legal and regulatory and fund launch working group. We've just got CMS, a legal firm investment association, representative of the fund managers, and we're in the FC sandbox. So we're taking a, a compliance first approach to this. And what that means is, and it, 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 we want to stay aligned with uh, changing what needs to change and only what needs to change. So if you look at the day in the life of process in a fund right now, we look at a day in the life of process in a fund on our system, see what workflows have changed, what new things have we brought into play, like an asset exchange, how does that potentially impact the regulations at each step, and then we're getting the blessing of those parties to make sure we know what the changes need to be, we know who's going to be making the changes, and then we're testing that in the pilot. Once all that gets ticked off, that means you've got a path to production, which we can uh, crack on with post the pilot. Okay. Um, so Kishan, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so on the on the first one, uh, Sans Coin. Uh, I just like to understand, uh, you know, your monetization model. How do you really make money, right? Uh, I, uh, is it on transaction or is it uh, uh, essentially? Uh, I just like to understand a little bit more on that. Then on the second one, uh, uh, you know, C Mercury. Look, that's interesting because I I'd seen a similar deal like that uh, some time ago. Uh, you know, you're actually replacing the, you know, the digital marketeer in SMEs and you're providing a platform where these small companies can use your platform to uh, optimize marketing spend, right? If I, if I kind of got your project correctly. Uh, what I'd like to know is what kind of uptake are you giving to these SMEs as opposed to pre-using your product versus after using your product? Uh, and the third one, uh, I didn't have any questions. I think some of the I had a question on the regulatory, but I think it was answered in the previous uh, by the previous uh, speaker or the panelists asked that question. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Kishana. Um, we make money by selling products, and uh, the Sanus Coin technology is at the service of Sanus Life. 
which is the issuer of Sanus coin. Okay, so it's a it's a technology. It's a cost that we 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 had to 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 spend in order to provide our network with this technology. We are not going to charge fees to our client because they're going to use the technology. We make money by uh, by selling product basically by having our community grow. Okay, thank you. Yes, and uh, there was a question also from Charles to Jacob. Uh, is there a timeline for your current development? Sorry, could you repeat that question for me? Is there a timeline for your current development? Yeah, yes. Uh, the current roadmap uh, for the... Uh, see, we, we have already completed uh, four modules. We already have the email, SMS, app, sorry, browser notifications and in website notifications. And we have built the ML layer on top of that. Currently we are working on the app side. Uh, so we are ready to start on the app side because you know we got, a, we, we got into a potential partnership with someone in the MENA region. And now we are working on the Arabic version of the whole application because that brings some money also into the system. So that came in between and now we are working with the Arabic version of the application. So that is hopefully, you know, we will complete it by the end of this month and rest of the modules we would expect to complete in another six months time. Also uh, a very aggressive uh, to the cloud migration is also planned down the line. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Charles, are you okay with the answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Taihu, do you have uh, questions or feedback? Yeah, I, I liked all the um, pictures. Thank you, guys. Um, I think for me, um, okay, yeah, I wanted to understand the revenue model for Sanus Coin, but I think you already answered that because Kishan asked. Um, for, for Jacob on C Mercury, I wanted to understand what the pricing was like in comparison to your other um, competitors in the space. For Brian, um, I was a bit unclear on the actual project itself, if it was for fund managers or it was just a B2C um, uh, product. And I also wanted to understand how you acquire your customers. That's also for Brian. Okay. Did, 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 did. Yeah. So for Jacob, uh, you had a comment on the price saying with regard to the competitors, right? Yes. Uh, Jacob, do you have a comment? Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so our current pricing model, see, uh, the, on, on the automation front, the pricing strategy is followed by companies. It's quite complex, I would say. There are a lot of companies who work on different models. Some companies work on cost per acquisition. Someone will say based on traffic, based on the traction. There are different types of pricing metrics. Someone will say, okay, we are going to work on the subscriptions, number of subscriptions which happen. So we are keenly evaluating how the pricing model will work. At this point, what we have done is like to make it very simple. We have created a bundle pricing, which gives the marketer the flexibility to choose the bundle of his choice. Plus we create uh, custom bundles also, like, you know, uh, if a marketer doesn't require a particular module, uh, he or she can opt out of it and uh, that will save them some money also because we are working predominantly with the small and medium enterprises. Uh, that is the current roadmap on the pricing front. Um, but I'm not sure we, uh, if this, you know, this will be strict on the long run, it may change because as the product evolves more, uh, if there is a probability that you know we may have to revisit the pricing strategy. Currently, we have the dual pricing published in our website also. All right, thank you. Okay. And uh, another question was for Brian, right? Yes. So, so in terms of what what we actually do, uh, we we've produced a, an application, uh, a, a call app, because it's in the call the network. And we, we ship that, it's the, same, it's the same call app that we ship to all customers, but it's configured on depending what role they are. So if you're a fund service provider, that code base allows you to do fund service and functionality. 
if you're a fund manager, you get to see the same data that's, uh, that's basically sold on the ledger, but you get fund management functionality. And the same goes for the regulator node and the same goes for the distributor node. They've all got different look through on the same data depending on what they do in the value chain. The key part being there is it's the same data. So it's, uh, that's the revolution. In terms of how do we get customers, uh, to begin, it's been, it, was, it was a hard slog using all of the, 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 the experience we've got in there. We've now got a core strategic advisor group of 12 fund managers, but we've got 40 already lined up beyond the strategic advisory group. We've got demand coming in from uh, West BI into Japan, and one of the big fund service providers into India, into China with another Singapore-based fund service provider. The major uh, body in the States is wanting us to come over there. We've got Scandinavia, have been asking us to expand into there. There's a need for what we're doing in Lux and also in uh, Ireland and in France. So it's already well known in the industry what we are doing and we're getting requested to go. But the other is a network effect here. The beauty of what we're doing is when the fund service providers join, they want their customers on. So we were talking to HSBC last week, they're looking at which fund managers are not inside the tent, how do they bring them on? And then likewise, uh, when we bring the distributors on, the last thing is we've got the investment bodies behind what we're doing. Uh, to the degree that some of the fund managers are saying they think there should be a regulated product, that would be great, mandated, <laughs> but you know, we can only wish. Anyway, even if that doesn't become the case, the investment association are lining up events for us to pitch what we're doing because Make no mistake, this is great for the industry, but this is also great for the end investor, which is super important. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, thank you, Taiwo, for your questions. And uh, Henry Rugan, uh, do you have uh, any questions, feedback? Sure, uh, I got a couple of questions and maybe just one comment here. Let's do uh, sort of chronologically, project one first. I think, uh, Claudio, you, you, I think there's one slide you showed how more, I think, I, I forgot the name of the slide. I think it's like a competition slide. I think you have yourself, your company on the slide, and then there are three or four other companies. And the other four companies, they're mostly uh, multi-tier level marketing companies. You know, they've been around 40, 50 years. Uh, uh, the, the question is, what are you doing differently than what they're doing? Uh, that's the first question for project one. Um, project two for Jacob. Um, Interesting what you're working on, uh, but also there's a lot of competition. I think you also showed the competition in a slide. It's a very crowded space, right? Um, I think my question is, what, what are you doing, sort of what's your differentiation uh, compared to your other competitors? Um, and then the, the last question is um, with uh, Brian, I believe, McNulty. Um, interesting project. I, I'm always a believer in blockchain technology in terms of disrupting a lot of industries. One of the very exciting areas is certainly financial services. You know, blockchain is also called internet of value. You know, with that said, can you address, maybe you have a cover, but I didn't, I didn't catch it earlier. Are you focusing more on capturing the front office opportunity or the back office opportunities or both? Uh, thank you, guys. Hey, hi, Ernie. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, some um, competition, differentiation. Um, Sun's Life started in 2006, and they uh, slowly uh, fine-tuned their business model, uh, literally by taking every single bit of those major competitors that be they believe works, and uh, doing exactly the same, and taking other bits and doing them differently, okay? It's very complex, so the whole thing is uh, to be uh, uh, explained, but the major differences are um, the plan, of uh, calculation of the compensation, super complex thing, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very efficient and it pleases very much the lower level of the, of the force, of the sales force, okay? Also the uh, pricing of the products, it's uh, uh, very uh, uh, reasonable, okay? Uh, which, is, which is very rarely the case in major competitors. The, um, the technological infrastructure is really, really strong. i give you an example. If you, uh, and I'm not talking about Samsung, I'm talking Samsung is just a part of the huge technological infrastructure. If you, if you check one of the major competitors, they, uh, and, and, and you compare that uh, technological infrastructure to the one of Samsung's life, you will see that we, we have um, uh, a way of, uh, let's say for instance, delivering uh, videos, 
between the, the people of the network, uh, providing uh, exactly information in many different uh, languages. So we have the whole thing. It's, it's really easy, easy to use. Okay, so if you do a comparison between us and uh, the major competitors, you see our, our infrastructure is really, really efficient. Okay, on top of that, uh, you, you add the fact that we are going into this, uh, uh, this uh, Samus coin system of transferring value. Okay, we will allow all our users around the world to receive their revenues uh, daily, which is also a big, big advantage compared to, to, to others. Uh, you know, the, 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 there are some users that make, a, a, make big money, but the majority, they make an average amount of money. We can provide them with what they deserve every day. This is, this is a huge. Also, because it's a perfect fit with this, with this economical instability, okay? Because this is, uh, for many people, an additional income, okay? Additional income in moments where they need more money. So we can provide them with a little bit of money every day. I hope I answered your question, Harry. Sure thing, thanks. And Jacob? Come to the question regarding whether it was, is it back office or front office? Uh, I guess it's, it's traditionally what would be seen as a back office to begin. We're cutting into the post-trade costs and the, the costs to uh, reconcile and settle transactions, but the benefits are realized uh, largely by the front office. The other ones that get, apart from the fees that we talked about, getting reduced significantly, and that, that we're talking significantly here with a model that's been ratified by all parties. Uh, we're, they're getting the immediacy of that data, and also they're getting to, uh, to distribute their funds in, a, in a, a, a price point in a more flexible way that their customers want. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brian, Henry, are, are you okay with the answer? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, and Jacob, could you also answer Henry's and um, uh, Kishan's questions? Sure. Uh, first, let me start with uh, Henry's question. Um, Henry asks, like, you know, whether the space is very much crowded. Yes, if you take marketing automation as a space, I know it's very much crowded, and there are a lot of standalone solutions also. But what we are building is much beyond all these engines. Maybe just one or two points I just wanted to highlight what we are working on. For example, like we are working on deep learning based AI perception for uh, social style, trend sensing, effect analysis and personality identification. These are the things we are really thinking of. Uh, maybe uh, something like deep reinforcement learning mediated marketing tools, uh, which will, which we believe can can literally revolutionize the way traditionally the marketing automation companies have been doing their job. Uh, for example, right now there is a campaign deployment manager, there is a creative manager, but in in our AI capability right now there is uh, no need of a creative design because there is a standard template. Into the template, the engine will deploy the right product proposition and specific to each of the users. So the product is chosen by the engine. Uh, the design template is predefined. And we have I have shown you the results, like what is the kind of uplift it gives. So there is a lot of differentiation what we are building. I know if, if you take standalone as marketing automation or uh, standalone channel service providers, there are hundreds of players. I do agree with you. Now, uh, moving to Kishan's question. Uh, what is the impact on the top, top line and the bottom line? Obviously, bottom line, there is, because for small enterprises, every money saved really matters. So uh, the kind of uplift we are able to give on their campaigns that potentially impacts uh, the ad spend, because ad spends will come down, and the return on investment against each of the individuals will really go up. So it will improve their uh, bottom line. There is no second thought into that. On the top line front, what exactly happens is that, you know, the case study which I presented before you, I've seen more number of transactions happening for the brands. So more the number of transactions happens when we start pushing ML-based recommendations rather than humans dictating the campaigns. So I believe it is going to impact the top line as well as the bottom line, but where is going to the impact on the higher side, I'm not still not clear. We are yet to do a proper research around this. Thank you, Jacob. And um, Adrian, do you have any questions or feedback? Um, I just have some comments. 
um, first about uh, Sanus Life. They have uh, very nice uh, incomes. And about Sanus Coin, you see many of the coins and tokens uh, uh, which are traded today, um, they have very little chances to be adopted. So ideally, they should cover at least a niche. So uh, uh, for them, pushing Sanus Coin the way they are pushing, also with micropayments, uh, even daily payments, which for network marketing is, is very, very difficult for other networking marketing companies, is very good. And I saw that they have uh, a very good legal partner also with them. So uh, the opportunity to adopt Sanus Coin is a very good thing for the future of this coin. Next, as a sales and marketing person, <clears throat> I'm very geeky with all the technology platforms. So with C Mercury, I saw that they have 100 billable clients. Is this the actual number of clients, uh, billable clients, or it's like a goal for you? 100 clients. These are billing customers. We are, we, these are the customers where we have a monthly recurring revenue. Which is very good. This is like the first milestone for such a platform in order to have like a proof of concept and to scale from there. Uh, what you, you need to do is to, to choose a niche or some types of customers to uh, specialize on. And also uh, with, uh, with Brian, with uh, um, the investment platform, this is a space which... Uh, is and will be disrupted and i believe very important here will be the the regulation part so uh, all success with all the projects very good niches very good projects thank you and uh, the final round of uh, so um, um we are announcing the winner for today the winner is brian mcnulty so founder ceo fund admin chain so congratulations uh with that brian any feedback from you oh, no, it's, it's, it's great it's great to hear the feedback and also the other pitches and both of them are going to look up and i wish you all the best guys i know it's a uh, it's tough for everyone right now but stick it stick in there and then uh, all the best to everybody on the, on the call yeah, and um, uh, maybe a bit brief feedback on this format of communication for you, online pitch competition. Do you uh, currently uh, use that in your fundraising campaign? How effective is that from you and any feedback from this particular event? Um, and I'd say the same answer whether I've won or lost. <laughs> but uh, no, fantastic. I think it's great to get some specific feedback, but also to just hear the, the line of questioning across all three uh, of the presenters, like to hear what, what it is that investors are looking for and what, how they're thinking about uh, the, 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 the things that are important. It's been really useful, so thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And what is your feedback, Jacob? Yeah, it has been a great opportunity. Uh, nice to take, get a lot of feedbacks. Uh, it is going to help us in a big way. And it has been uh, very inspirational to listen to various investors, their feedbacks and i look forward to more opportunities in future thank you thank you everyone thank you jacob and claudio yeah thank you to everybody i really enjoyed it really enjoyed to to listen to to, to so many investment uh, opinions and also the products that uh, are, are really cool so thank you guys well, thank you claudio and um Tewu, how is um, um, your impression of our today's event uh, the pitch competition and the discussion Anything you would like to add? I mean, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the session, and you just listening to um, just the other thought processes by other fellow investors and speakers on the panel. Um, I think this was well organized. I'm very happy the internet cooperated today, <laughs> and the Zoom call is very smooth. Um, so it's been very helpful learning from everyone else on the call, as well as the different the different pitches as well. Just gaining insights as to other. Um, you know, business models. I think I've reached out to some of them to send me their pitches um, directly so I could just review in my um, spare time and probably set up another one on one call um, if it fits our investment criteria. So this has been very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Taewoo. And uh, Sierra, what's your feedback? What's your impression about today's event? 
Um, I was quite impressed by today's um, panel. Overall, um, I really enjoyed the presentations from Claudio, Jacob, and Brian. Um, overall, I'm really optimistic that we can pull through the great lockdown with a great reset. And as our fellow panelists, Henry Nan, Henry Aselli, and Taiwo have mentioned, startup founders who are strong-minded, nimble, visionary, resilient with a survivor mentality during times of hardship will be the ones who will be leading the pack. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sierra. And Charles, what's your feedback on today's event? Any comments, suggestions you would like to add? Yeah, the event is great. Um, uh, I'd love to see more about uh, about their projects in detail. I think that's the only thing that I would say that's uh, there's the, the timing. Uh, it's a little bit more constraint. So if, you know, if there's a uh, I'm welcome to for them to send me an email and then send me more about their projects. So yeah. Uh, yes, just feel free to share your contacts so that uh, yeah. if you, some if you have some preferred way of communication for all the three yeah. projects, just so, uh, should I type it in or or? Oh, uh, yes, you can type in in the chat so that all the projects could copy and write. Uh, uh, sure. Your so, it, yeah. so it's C H A R L E S dot w u at gsrmatrix.com and i'll type it in so yeah thank you and thank um, you. Yeah. yeah thank you you know that i'm already a big supporter of these uh, events and i believe it's a very safe place for the startup founders to get feedback and if you take notes from uh, the feedback from i don't know a few sessions uh, you can get uh, dozens of uh, thousands of euros in potentially consulting fees if you are uh, having consultants giving you this kind of feedback. So very valuable. Hopefully everybody takes notes, take notes. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I hope that uh, during this type of panel discussions, roadshow, speech competitions, startup leader, uh, leader clubs, uh, keynotes and masterclasses, uh, we get our VC community united and uh, we have more of uh, formats of interaction so that we keep up with the pace of the time and innovation and help uh, serial entrepreneurs with successful startups find their best investors to join their on board. Thank you all and um, see you soon at our further events. And uh, at the same link, you will find the recording of today's session and the highlights of the major key points from each of the participants. Thank you all and get contacted and please send the uh, more detailed information to all the investors who are interested and stay in touch. Bye-bye.